whether it's the EPA and trying to stock a scientific advisory board with lobbyists or any of these other uh, cases, and, you know, there is a real war on expertise. And right. So there doesn't seem to be a neutral expertise involved in these meetings anymore. Jacob, thank you. As always, Jacob Ward is That's NBC fine. News' senior uh, technology reporter. All right, a Walmart employee says he's now facing backlash from the company after organizing a protest against the retailer's Listen stance up. on gun sales. Thomas Marshall says he called on his fellow employees to walk out of work later today and sign a change.org petition urging the company to stop selling firearms and ammunition after two recent shootings at the company's stores. There was a shooting in El Paso this past weekend, and just last week, two people were shot and killed at a Walmart in South Haven, Mississippi. Walmart has responded to the employees' calls for protest, writing in part, quote, there are many more constructive avenues for employees to offer feedback. Joining me now is Thomas Marshall, who works in Walmart's e-commerce department. Thomas, uh, tell me what, what happened. What did you do that, um, that caught the attention of the company? Hi, I just want to say thank you so much for having me and thank you for continuing to keep the spotlight on this very important issue. Really what happened was on Monday, the events of the weekend really hit home for a lot of us at the office and we felt like we had to do something, especially after the response from corporate both internally and externally was little more than offering thoughts and prayers. And we really believed that we needed to take a stand and I felt personally that if I didn't I would be complicit in selling firearms. I would be continuing to work for a company that made money off of, you know, being a merchant of death. So what did they do? Did they tell you to stop? Uh, or they, mm -hmm. It sounds like they cut off your, your ability to communicate, but have you been disciplined or have you been fired or somebody called you to tell you uh, you're not supposed to organize? A merchant of death. So on Monday, before the story broke in the press, mm -hmm. there was little backlash from the company itself. However, when uh, Tuesday came around, the day of our um, planned strike, the media had really, you know, very thankfully taken, um, taken an interest in the story and it just spread very, very quickly. And it was at that point, um, about midway through the day, when I returned to the office uh, for lunch to meet with some colleagues to, you know, organize the walkout that we've planned for today at 3 p.m., that um, when I checked my computer, I saw that uh, I wasn't able to access Slack. And um, another person that I was working with, the other organizer, Kate, her and I were the only two that have currently gone public um, with our names and information. Both her and I, um, we saw that we didn't have access to Slack, which is our uh, company messenger, which is where we actually first propagated that and, and is there any chance that's check. coincidental yes. in other words did you call it and say how come my slack's not working no so basically we looked at our slack then our emails and then every single part of our uh, computers started just we lost access completely and then i immediately called um members of the press that uh, i had been in contact with and within the hour both my manager and her manager walked down to meet us in, in the cafeteria took us to separate rooms to meet with an hr representative and then explain to us what was going on. Their rationale was that because we had called out sick today for you know our protest, uh -huh. we didn't need access to our company computers because we wouldn't need to do any work for that day. So we they are, did uh, not tell so you that they cut off access to your communications with your fellow employees as a result of your organizing actions? That's, uh, they never mentioned that specifically. They said it was because, because of that reason. And then additionally, they did reprimand me for the fact that I both had sent out that email and then Kate also sent out the, uh, another mass email on Tuesday, both calling for a strike, calling for employees to sign our change.org petition, which now has over 30,000 signatures the last time I checked, as well as, uh, those are the Walmart we employees? Have today. It's actually a, a public okay. currently. But we, um, the on we only circulated it initially through Walmart employees, so we have no idea of knowing through you know, change.org right. like which, where those are coming from, but just based on the amount of private messages that, that all of us in the organization you know, organizing these events have gotten from either coworkers by word of mouth, by um, you know, over Slack and over email back when I you know, had access to that, um, there is a lot of support, but a majority of employees are very, very worried that um, they will face similar retaliation. And you know, we're very, you know, we're still trying to get the word out. We're still trying to make this as, um, you know, in, make sure everyone knows this is as important of an issue as it is. Tom, to really, are you worried you're going to get fired? Dialogue. I have, um, you know, I have faith in my First Amendment rights, and I have faith in the protections that I have for being able to, you know, speak on these issues. However, 
Um, you know, if that is the case, if I do end up getting fired for this, that is a risk I am willing to take. Thomas Marshall, uh, please stay in close touch with us about how this develops. Thomas Marshall is a Walmart employee. Thank you so much. Coming up, after the shootings in Dayton, Ohio, the state's Republican governor is now calling for much stricter gun laws, but will his idea be able to pass through a Republican-dominated legislature? Governor Mike DeWine joins me next. You are watching MSNBC. That Breakfast wants you back. Try is, just packing. That is extreme right there that Walmart would be willing to do one of their own employees that way simply based around an employee that didn't want to sell guns of merchandising death. That's, uh, that's pretty severe. Let's see what else we got going on here. This is the governor there in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio in which I spent a lot of time in, pertaining to being in some parades and passing out a lot of literature up in that area. So, just ask Home Advisor. All right, it looks like we're fixing to... to uh, Especially these days. Looks like we're fixing to have to hit this commercial at the wrong time for my viewers, but the fact of the matter is, this has become a very, very serious, serious personal subject for people, not just the people that's been affected directly as far as the victims, but the people indirectly. People are getting tired of seeing this again and 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 again. And it makes you almost wonder is our politicians actually purposely allowing for this to happen? Kind of like, is our politicians purposely allowing for various countries to come in and hack us or to steal our identity? I mean, you have to start asking a question, and, and the conversation come up this morning whenever I was over in the YMCA uh, today doing some uh, exercising uh, with me and a gentleman, you have to ask yourself a question, is this somebody like George Soros that's putting out a lot of money to different organizations, different people that's, uh, that's intentionally doing stuff like this so that we can move in a certain direction as a society? I don't know. Uh, but, but we feel like that something is going on uh, and we're just not talking about uh, going to the, the, the tip of the top of the pyramid pertaining to the Illuminati's, but we're talking about something is really happening here in America that you begin to start scratching your head towards wondering why has this went on the amount of time that it's went on. Do we just have a bunch of politicians that don't know what to do, or do we have a bunch of politicians that's purposely planning this so that there will be a federal siege in regard to martial law that will be distributed so a certain entity or a certain group will be able to take over all of us? You have to start asking yourself a question, are we purposely being sabotaged? Some people believe yes. I don't know, but it makes you wonder because we can smell a rat in the woodpile per se, as the old country boy used to say, something just don't smell right in regard to all this that has went on for this length of time. its currency to work around those tariffs, making their currency worth less, and the Chinese product becomes less expensive to an American buyer, maybe going back to $200, giving the Chinese made air conditioner an advantage over the American made air conditioner. China's central bank is rejecting the U.S. accusations of manipulating currency, saying that low label would seriously undermine the international financial order and trigger financial market turmoil. They're not saying they didn't change the value of the U.N., which they can do... Uh, 
their central bank can do every night at 9 15 p.m. Eastern. That's not how it works in America. The United States is also viewing China's move as retaliation after President Trump promised to impose more than 10 percent uh, tariffs on the 300 billion dollars of Chinese goods that have not yet been affected by the trade war starting on September 1st. These goods include smartphones, clothing, toys, and other consumer products. So expect to have all that stuff cost you more. Joining us now to take a closer look at this is Linda Yu. She's an economist and author of the book, What Would the Great Economists Do? Linda, good to see you again. Thank you for being with us. I guess the question I've got about what China is doing right now, this secret weapon that China has, they can manipulate their currency in a way that America cannot do because for, for a lot of reasons that we don't need to get into here. Is this China in desperation saying, we've got to make a big move to really make America come to the table and cut a deal? Or is this China saying, we got a trick that you guys don't have, we can withstand this, um, and, and they're prepared to escalate it? What, what's the motivation, do you think? Hmm. I think it's certainly tit for tat, and the overall picture is one of escalation. So, of course, China, as you said, and that's a really good illustration, um, it, they peg their currency to a certain basket of currency. So they actually control the value of the currency. The dollar is a free-floating currency, so that is not a tool that's available. So the timing of them changing the value of the currency, because remember, that is within the control of the central bank, uh, means that it looks like it's in retaliation to President Trump imposing 10% tax on all, all of the remaining Chinese imports going into the United States. Now, the reason I think this is an escalation is because the expectation after the last round of trade talks is that the U.S. and China were actually coming closer to a deal. But then, with the imposition of new tariffs, then, then the uh, Chinese currency weakening, and then, of course, the latest salvo being fired across the bows is that China is now not buying U.S. agricultural this products. This is a very big so deal, It certainly Linda. looks to be like a tip or task. Because very the United States so the United cannot... Um, cannot find markets easily for all the soybeans that we were sending to China or, or various other things that China buys as raw material and processes. We just don't have the infrastructure or other markets to sell that into. So that, too, is one that's going to uh, affect this trade war. Yeah, very much so. So I think this latest shot is actually going to have a direct impact. It's serious. It's serious enough that I know personal farmers right here within a 25-mile radius that are going out of their way towards building big silos, big uh, being our corn, uh, I'm gonna call them silos, um, huge amounts of expense is going in towards being able to have storage areas to be able to store this granary so that, uh, so that maybe the farmer won't completely lose everything off of his back. It's really sad whenever you're dealing with agriculture this way that is basically uh, basically the fundamental fabric of our existence because whenever I was growing up my grandmother and grandfather used to tell us that if the farmers fail we all fail and that really holds a great deal of truth in regard towards survival in eating and having nutrition to be able to survive. So, so I think this latest shot is actually going to have a direct impact, especially on farmers. So China accounts for something like 60% of the world's soybean market. And if you look at the impact on farmers, you know, it's about half of um, what was sold last year to China agricultural. Um, goods, that's mm. how much it's dropped over the course of one year because of this trade war. So the White House is now earmarking $28 billion to support farmers who can't sell their products. But I don't expect this will be the latest, uh, the last I should say, it's just yeah. the latest of this tit for tat. Linda, good to talk to you as always. Thank you for joining me. Linda Yu is an economist and the author of an excellent book called What Would the Great Economists Do? President Trump's going to land in El Paso, Texas any minute. Joining me now is Ana Maria Archila, the co-executive director at the Center for Popular Democracy. She's one of the contributors to a Washington Post op-ed titled Hispanics in America are Under Attack. Ana Maria, good to see you. Thank you so much. This is um, an issue that has come to the front. Most people 
certainly Hispanics in America would understand that since Donald Trump came down that escalator at Trump Tower uh, more than three years ago, he, he's, he opened his campaign with an attack on Hispanics. But now it has become something yet more serious than the rantings of a guy who wants the nomination of the Republican Party. That's right. President Trump, from day one of his campaign, has made anti-immigrant rhetoric, specifically targeting Latinx communities, Hispanic communities, the centerpiece of his political program and his political strategy. On day one, he said, Mexicans are rapists and criminals, and I'm going to build a wall and round them up and deport them and create an environment of fear and terror for immigrant families in this country. I'm going to stop right there and correct her because I know the truth and I know that other people know the truth. Donald Trump has said not all are rapists, not all are murderers, not all are bad people. I have heard him say that many, many times and what they're doing here, they're taking things out of context in trying to make Donald Trump look like that he is the boogeyman in regard to all this. And I'm not going to stand and defend his innocence because some of the rhetoric that he does project out to society, the way that he projects it, can be misinterpreted towards somebody feeling like that Donald Trump is a white supremacist and that he is against any type of race other than his race pertaining to all these problems here in America. Now, I don't know if he intentionally does that or if he's doing that ignorantly. I don't know what's going on in the man's heart. Keep in mind, he's not a professional politician. He's only an actor and a businessman, okay? Uh, I, 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 I just want to call it as I see it. And, and I can see how that they're misconstruing the things that Donald Trump has, has tried to do pertaining to putting up the wall. And he has never said that all Latinos, that all Mexicans are all super bad, cruel people. They're coming up with this analogy on their own. I do want to correct what's going on here to my and viewers. he has done that targeting Latino communities, as we know today, one of... She believes that he has done that. Okay? For some reason, she believes that Donald Trump has targeted 100% of all Latinos and Mexicans. And I know that that's not the truth, because I've heard him bring in messages before. And yes, he would bash those that needed to be bashed, but he would also support and brag on those that needed support. The largest raids happened. Um, 600 people got rounded up, but he's also targeted Muslim communities. And during his presidency, we have seen attacks against. He's targeting evil demonic people, regardless whether they come in the form of Latinos, come in the form of, of uh, Arabs, come in the form of ISIS, now, I don't agree with what Donald Trump's done with Saudi Arabia. There's a lot of people that don't agree with that. But give or take, uh, I'm not the guy uh, that's sitting in the office that's making these type of decisions. I just know that people believe what they want to believe. And if this individual that's talking right here, if she has made it up in her mind that Donald Trump is as she's describing Donald Trump, me and you could talk to her until we're blue in the face and she's going to continue to believe what she believes about Donald Trump. It's, it's similar to the same way about my status here in Northwest Tennessee or West Tennessee. Uh, there are certain people just right down the road from me that I could prove to them on paper going all the way back to the events that happened in 1991 pertaining to being falsely accused of being an assassin towards taking out one of the presidencies in the United States of America, I could prove to them that I did not make any type of statement regarding that. In black and white, I could prove to them. I could actually get the attorneys, Jolene Nugent, 
I could get my ex-wife. I would say I could get my brother, but he's dead now. But there's various people that I could get that would stand in my corner, or, or I at least hope that they would. And with the paperwork proving my innocence, but even though I proved my innocence, there's still going to be people like her that has made it, made it up in her mind that Juby is crazy. The individual is talking to you right now on on this uh, on this YouTube platform, and that Juby is mean and cruel, and that Juby is the boogeyman, just like Donald Trump is the boogeyman. This is a deception that Satan has manipulated various people and various cultures throughout our country. It's sad, but it's true. Um, Muslim communities, Jewish communities, black and brown people across the country. He's fanning the flames of hate while also fanning the flames of violence in his rallies, we see what happens um, from, the, from the moment of the campaign to the rallies that he's holding now, where he allows the crowd to get frenzied up and say... Just like him saying the statement, send her back, or send them back. I agree. That statement never should have been made. I can understand the reason why he made the statement, based around some of the criticism of those four... I guess Congress or Senators or whatever whoever that they was. I think they're calling them uh, calling them the squad or something like that. I can understand the reason why he said that simply because of all the criticism that they was announcing about American politics and was taking jabs at Jerusalem. But at the same time I can see both sides to where one was just as wrong as the other and one was just as right as the other. Just like I can see where not everybody in Jerusalem are holier than thou and they're good people. People needs to wake up to what Satan is doing here towards creating all this all this adversity and all this uh, confusion. And that's exactly what it is. It's the handiwork of Satan that we're seeing working through various groups and working through various people that is causing this to be a very, very complex situation. Send her back home, or um, other so other forms of insight. Them. Exactly. Here's the question, though. This is the first time we have seen. We've often seen uh, people in communities that are devastated by something not want federal officials to come in because it takes resources away. But the protests today are different. That is an interesting tenor. People saying, "Don't come here," or "You're the problem." Will those responses affect the president, or will they just not sort of? He won't. He won't really be exposed to it all that much, and it won't make any difference. I think President Trump doesn't know how to listen to the people in this country, especially communities of color, especially people that are not the centerpiece of his of his uh, political strategy to remain in power. So I have I place no hope in his ability to listen to the people of El Paso who are saying don't come here, or the people of Ohio who are saying don't come here. You are actually fanning the flames of hate. You are inciting people to commit acts of violence in our communities. Um, what I do believe is that people in this country recognize that we have a problem with white nationalist uh, violence and ideology, and this is an opportunity for incredible solidarity. Um, I believe that um, people in this country have reacted to the violence coming from the, from the White House in really beautiful ways. When people saw children in cages and families separated at the border, thousands and thousands of people marched. When people saw children in Florida in a school um, getting shut up by a classmate, thousands of people, millions of people showed up. So I believe in the power of people to show up for each other, to take care of each mm -hmm. other, um, and to really see what um, the problem that we have as a nation. President Trump is actually uh, a <coughs> symptom of a problem that has been kind of the underbelly of this country for a long time. Uh, believe in a hierarchy of human life where white people, white men are at the center and the rest of us <coughs> fall down the slope of that hierarchy. Um, and we cannot be the country that, that we want to be um, if we don't address the reality of race in this country and if we don't imagine the possibility of all the people being at the center 
of having a multi-racial multi democracy that expresses the best of who we are. And President Trump, I don't think, is the person that will get us there. Uh, we will end on remembering those people who lost their lives in Dayton and in El Paso so that perhaps the response that Americans have had <laughs> will come true. These are the people who lost their lives in this story that we are talking about. Anna Maria Archula is the co-executive director of the the deadline point. New York. Donald Trump is on his way to El Paso, Texas, where deep divisions await him. We'll take you there momentarily, but we start with a case against Donald Trump delivered in a forceful speech this afternoon by Democratic frontrunner, former Vice President Joe Biden. I'm going to end this right here. I'm having difficulty right now with perception because there's a storm coming in. <clears throat> I'm talking about right now a literal storm that's coming in over my area that's affected my dish network but there's also a political literal storm a human storm that's coming into America pertaining to all these guns and if we do not seize this problem quick enough if we don't watch there's going to be major major bloodshed up onto the streets of America like we have not seen since the Civil War. Please pray for America and please pray for these victims who have recently died at the hand of an assassin. Thank you.